Good evening. I'm Amy Weinstein, Senior Curator of Oral History at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, which kicks off our fall 2019 programming season. As always, we extend a special welcome to our museum members and to those tuning in to our live web broadcast at 911memorial.org slash live. We also extend a warm welcome to the 9-11 survivors, responders, and family members who are with us to mark the launch of The Only Plane in the Sky, an oral history of 9-11 by Garrett Graff, the distinguished journalist and historian. I suspect most of you are familiar with his considerable accomplishments. You probably don't need me to tell you that Garrett became the first blogger accredited to cover White House press briefings in 2005, only a few years after the birth of that genre, and that he has taught digital journalism at Georgetown. I could list prior books and awards received for The Threat Matrix and Dawn of the Code War. Instead, I'll follow my usual oral history practice and let Garrett Graff introduce himself to you as he did when first writing to me in February 2017. I'm a magazine writer and historian, and I wrote a piece last September for Politico magazine about being aboard Air Force One on 9-11. The reaction to the piece really floored me. It was the most popular piece ever published by Politico. I'm in the beginning stages of turning that article into a broader book that's an oral history of September 11th. I'd love to tell you a bit about my project and see what, what might be available in the museum's archives and collection. Sincerely, Garrett. That simple, genuine, persuasive email began an intensive collaboration in which Garrett and his very able research assistant, Jenny Pachuki, an oral historian in her own right, and our colleague at the museum for many years, mined our collection of more than 1,000 oral histories, listening to hundreds of hours of testimony, and repeated that daunting undertaking at the Pentagon and Flight 93 archives. A skilled interviewer and dogged researcher, Garrett recorded even more oral histories of his own. He used his journalistic talents and depths of compassion to insert just the right moments from each of those narratives into the book that became the only plane in the sky. When you explore the museum, you walk through a compilation of voices recalling where they were when they first heard that something was wrong on that September morning 18 years ago. Perhaps you've spent a few moments in the audio alcoves listening to a responder or survivor describe her actions that day. Garrett, Ga Garrett Graff did precisely that, but on a monumental scale. Like a potter working with clay, he shaped the stories he heard into a beautifully formed, artfully glazed, watertight vessel, the 9-11 oral history book that achieved critical acclaim immediately upon publication. We are grateful to you, Garrett, for joining us to share your insights into that remarkable endeavor. Following the program, all of you will have the opportunity to purchase his new book, The Only Plane in the Sky. Please join me in welcoming Garrett Graff in conversation with Senior Director of Public and Professional Programs, Jessica Chen. So Garrett, thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on the book. It is a tremendous undertaking and I'm looking forward to getting into it with you. Um, I actually had the good fortune of being with you at the start of this project, um, having just joined the museum team maybe a couple months before giving you a tour of the museum. Um, and so, you know, we've heard a little bit of, uh, from Amy about how this project began, but maybe you can talk to us a little bit more, you know, um, even as a journalist, how it was like transitioning into the discipline of oral history. And what were some of the early decisions you made in, in terms of thinking and conceiving of the book? Yeah. Um, well, thanks, Jess, for uh, having me tonight. And thanks to Amy for that uh, very generous introduction. I'm uh, very excited to be here. Um, this community of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum was a very integral part of this project. Um, and I am uh, very grateful uh, to be here and for the support uh, that the museum showed this um, and really honored um, some of the voices in the book uh, are here tonight and I got to meet for the first time tonight, uh, which was a very special 
uh, experience. Um, so this, uh, as Amy said, this book grew out of this article that I wrote for the 15th anniversary of 9-11 about being aboard uh, Air Force One with President Bush. Um, and I had been, my, uh, I, I write almost exclusively about very uplifting and uh, happy topics. And so my last book was about nuclear war <laughs> and, uh, and all of the doomsday plans that the US government had uh, created during the Cold War. And in the course of that research, I'd gotten interested in President Bush's day and how he, sort of at this moment when the nation so needed leadership, he was uh, rushed aboard and hidden aboard this metal tube in the sky eight miles above the earth, largely cut off from the country and what was transpiring below. And the reaction to that piece, as Amy said, was just sort of fascinating mm -hmm. to me. Um, and, and there were two letters I got from readers that really stood out in my mind. Um, one was from a mother, a veteran, who had two children, uh, seven and nine, who uh, she said she'd printed out the article so that when they were old enough to read it, she could explain to them why mommy had left them to go off to war. Mm -hmm. And the other was from another veteran, a uh, younger army, uh, who'd done three tours, two in Afghanistan, one in Iraq. And he wrote me and said that he'd been in middle school on 9-11 and had never really understood the trauma that the nation felt until the, in, until he had sort of seen this article and seen the day through President Bush's eyes. And that just really st stuck with me, that sort of this, we were now far enough removed from 9-11 that there were people serving in Iraq and Afghanistan who didn't have an emotional connection to 9-11 itself. Um, and, and of course, actually, this year, the 18th anniversary marks the first time that we are now deploying American servicemen and women to Iraq and Afghanistan to fight wars older than they are, um, which is something that America has never had before. You know, every American who fought in World War II remembers Pearl Harbor. Everyone who fought in the Civil War remembered Fort Sumter. They sort of had the emotional underpinning of what that, you know, had, what had sort of led us into that conflict. And, and to me, sort of the power of oral history that it brings to 9-11 specifically, and I think the, the importance of remembering the voices of this event in particular uh, in our modern history, is that the story that we tell ourselves about 9-11, now when we tell it as history, is neater and cleaner than the 9-11 that any of us experienced that day. Um, you know, we talk about it, uh, uh, you know, it started at 8.46 with the first crash. It, uh, at, it was over 102 minutes later with the collapse of the second tower at 10.29 Eastern time. And that's not how any of us who were alive that day experienced 9-11. The, we didn't know when it began. We didn't know when it was over. We didn't know what was coming next. We, uh, you know, and I talk about in the book, um, you know, well into the afternoon, remember the fear was that there were potentially as many as a dozen additional hijacked planes in the air. Um, there was the fear that we that these attacks were not going to be limited to just New York and, uh, and, the, uh, and the Pentagon. Um, you know, the Prudential Center in Boston was evacuated. The Sears Tower in Chicago was evacuated. Skyscrapers were evacuated in Los Angeles. Disney closed on 9-11, the only time it has ever closed in its history uh, sort of for a hostile act, I mean, for not for uh, you know, basically natural disasters. And, uh, and like that was the 9-11 that we lived. And, and if I think when we look at 
and we think about a generation that we are now sort of turning the world over to, uh, who are going to live their entire adult lives in the world sort of created and shaped by 9-11, um, the facts that we tell, the history that we tell of 9-11 doesn't account for the national reaction to 9-11. Because what drove the nation's leaders, which what drove the decisions that we made after 9-11 were as much driven by the emotions of that day and the experience of the day as it was by sort of the cold facts of history as we write them down. Yeah, and you know, so the book is comprised of 480 different um, perspectives of Americans who had a lived experience of that day. And I think you get a sense of, you know, there's a rough chronology to the book, but it's not a neat chronology. And it's certainly, I would say, the book is driven more by emotion and by sensory experience at the various um, sites where the attacks are occurring and even, you know, in other parts of America as people are, tr are trying to figure out what is going on. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, what were some of the challenges in terms of weaving those stories together? And um, speaking particularly to the emotionality of the book, because I think um, even as somebody who works in this material often, I was struck in a different way by the emotionality of reading these experiences put together the way you've put them together. Um, did that emotionality surprise you, impact you in a way that you, you may not have imagined, or maybe you did? Yeah. Um, so. It uh, in what I hope will be the dumbest comment I make on stage tonight, I was really unprepared for how emotional writing a book about 9-11 turned out to be. Um, and it was, um, it, you know, both in the, um, uh, uh, as Amy said, the book is um, both a mix of archived oral histories from the 9-11 Museum, the 9-11 Tribute Center, the Flight 93 National Memorial, the Capitol Hill Historian, the Pentagon Historian, um, a number of other projects around the country, um, and then sort of original interviews that, that I did and collected myself. And um, uh, Jenny and I sort of assembled a pile of about 2,000. Uh, we've, we found about 5,000 across the country and sort of loosely sorted that down to a pile of 2,000 that was the the building blocks of the book and ended up with about 480 uh, voices in it. And most most of the people in the book you, you sort of don't follow through the whole day. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's probably only two or three dozen people who you sort of follow um, start to finish over the course of the day. And people sort of come and go as sort of their one moment of drama uh, 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 touches the day, or uh, and some people, you know, appear for a single observation. Um, uh, but what uh, what I found in the uh, reading through them and listening to these stories um, is, you know, as tragic as the that day is, as you know, uh, the incredible sadness that underpins so many of the stories. There are these incredible stories of sort of hope and strength and bravery. Um, and, and that I think actually, when, when all is said and done, to me one of the things that's actually interesting about the book is that it ends up in, in some ways uh, being more hopeful and inspirational than you might imagine, given the subject matter. Because the, the way that so many Americans reacted to that day is I think a testament to the incredible resilience of the human spirit, and you mm -hmm. see that, um, you know, in, in ways that are sort of very famous. You know, the first responders um, uh, at the Twin Towers. Um, you see that in the military officers at the Pentagon who rush out of the burning building, realize their colleagues are still trapped, and then turn around and rush back into the burning building. Um, and then you see it in these sort of in very tiny uh, sort of individual stories. Um, John Abruzzo, um, uh, who, who we sort of follow uh, it, as he's evacuated, he's a um, quadriplegic working in the North Tower on the 64th floor of, for the Port Authority. And uh, 12 of his colleagues uh, team up and carry him down all 64 floors um, and get him out and get him out with minutes to spare and sort of collectively put 
uh, their, you know, their own lives on the line and sort of make very clear to him, you know, on the 64th floor, like, John, we're not leaving without you. Like, we, um, you know, there is, you, you get no say in us evacuating you. Yeah. Um, I do want to get more into these moments and, and have you kind of share. Um, opening the book, though, we, we start in a place that couldn't be farther from the, the site of the attacks or the sites of the attacks. Um, we start in space at the International Space Station. So I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about kind of why start there um, and how does that kind of create a frame for the, for the book itself? Yeah. Um, so uh, this is actually uh, a, a, a frame that I got from the 9-11 Museum because if, if you walk through, uh, you will see his quotes on the wall uh, in the museum, Frank Culbertson, who was the NASA astronaut, was the one American off the planet Earth on 9-11. Um, he was aboard the International Space Station. And he was able to actually see the attacks unfold from the space station. Um, he, uh, he, he watched the uh, collapse, I think it was the second tower, if, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, from space, you know, looking down on Lower Manhattan, was able to see the dust cloud of the second collapse spreading across Lower Manhattan. On the next rotation, goes over Washington and is able to see the scar in the Pentagon and to see the emergency vehicles responding uh, to the Pentagon. And then he sort of talks about how you know every rotation they come around, you know, every 90 minutes with the International Space Station over the course of the day, and he sort of looks down to see what has happened next. And what, has, uh, what they notice over the course of the day is the skies emptying out and the airplanes across the country being grounded uh, until uh, there's just, he can see just one airplane left flying across the United States, and it's President Bush flying back from Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska to Washington, D.C. Um, uh, the, the title of the book, The Only Plane in the Sky. And so this is a historic moment in that, you know, this is the first um, attack against America witnessed from outer space, and he's witnessing another historic moment unfolding that, you know, is not often discussed when we think about 9-11 because the scale, the enormity of the day is so much that it, it, it eclipses everything else that's happening. Um, on 9-11, the FAA makes, um, hist makes history by issuing an unprecedented full ground stop over U.S. airspace. And this is a moment that you cover in the book with oral history. Um, can you tell us a little bit about kind of the significance of that and also kind of the, the emotion as well as the decision making that occurs um, in, a, in, a, in a small space but with enormous impact? Yeah. Um, so this, this is the, uh, you know, the book follows not just the, um, the Twin Towers, Shanksville, the Pentagon, but um, you know, people in passenger jets uh, and, and passengers and crew in, uh, in passenger jets around the country and fighter pilots and air traffic control towers. Um, and sort of one of the things that becomes clear as, as, as I was doing this history was the th there was so much that day that happened that on any other day of modern American history would be one of the most dramatic things that has ever happened in modern American history. And on 9-11 was like not even one of the 10 or 12 most interesting things that happened that day. And so there are these monumental sort of Herculean stories that are, are sort of largely brushed over in the history that we tell, in part because like some of them unfolded you know, within hours of 9-11 you know, sort of before anyone was really paying attention. Um, and there are sort of two that I spend uh, real chunks of time in the book talking about, the first being the, this, uh, uh, this decision by the FAA to ground every plane in the country. Um, and when I say the FAA, um, I actually mean one guy um, whose name is Ben Sliney, who's the National Operations Manager for the FAA on 9-11, who uh, was in charge of the U.S. airspace that day and was in the first day on the job. Um, and he started that morning as the national operations manager for the FAA. And in the first 90 minutes of his first day, gives two orders that no American in history has ever given before or since. 
The first is sort of shortly after the second attack uh, at the panic, or the second crash in New York City uh, to institute a nationwide ground stop. Uh, and any plane that is not in the air is not going to be allowed to take off. And then at, uh, I think it's 942, a couple of minutes after the attack at the Pentagon, uh, he issues the order to land every plane in the country at the closest airport, regardless of destination, and regardless of whether the airport is actually in any position to receive the number of airplanes that are about to land at it. Um, and this we sort of, we sort of only, uh, I think in our sort of national memory uh, of 9-11, only remember sort of the back end of this story, which is the 38 planes that end up, the, uh, the transatlantic flights that end up in Gander, Newfoundland, um, the 7,000 uh, passengers who are dropped into a town of 9,000 on an island uh, off the Canadian coast. And then, um, it, but it's sort of this incredible story. They landed uh, 750 planes in the first 10 minutes after this order is given. Um, across the country, and, and effectively, um, you know, all but a few dozen are down within about an hour, hour and a half. Um, and you know, it was just sort of this huge uh, undertaking, uh, totally improvised. No one had trained for this. We had no protocols to handle it, and that uh, and that really unfolded before most of us were sort of even really paying attention to that day. And then the other, of course, um, is the maritime evacuation of Lower Manhattan, which again is sort of one of these stories that most Americans, I think particularly if you're not in New York City, uh, you, you have only the vaguest memory, if at all, that this happened at all, but that over the course of the morning of September 11th, there was uh, this sort of makeshift armada of uh, tugboats and passenger ferries and fishing vessels and pleasure yachts uh, that uh, led the largest ev maritime evacuation in history, the larger than the British evacuation of Dunkirk. Um, and it was totally improvised and it was sort of largely overseen, um, again, by this one guy uh, named uh, Coast Guard Lieutenant Michael Day. Um, uh, and, and then some of the Sandy Hook pilots uh, who sort of helped, uh, uh, who helped direct these, the, these boats um, al along the coast of Lower Manhattan. Um, and, and Michael Day sort of talks about in the book, he, in, in his oral history, you know, that he broke more laws that day than he has enforced in the totality of the rest of his entire Coast Guard career. Um, and that uh, you know, the, again, it's this incredible story that in any other day of the year, uh, if we had evacuated a half million people from the tip of Lower Manhattan with zero minutes notice um, in the space of, um, you know, about six hours, uh, you know, that would be a very big historic event. And it, it's something that, uh, you know, I think most Americans have no idea really occurred at all. Point out that within this, you know, this big moment where there's all of these boats and these these vehicles trying to just kind of take people to safety, there are also these incredibly tender, human, intimate details that come through um, with people's accounts. That I think, again, when we go back to this idea of fact versus experience, of emotionality versus chronology, you know, Tom Sullivan, a firefighter. Um, remembers mothers and nannies with infants in their arms were dropping their children down to us. At one point, we had four or five of them wrapped in little blankets, and we put them in bunks down in the crew quarters. I put four babies in one bunk, like little peanuts lined up in a row. And it's, I think it's, you know, when you were um, going through these interviews, when you were conducting them, or when you were listening to these oral histories, you know, what was the effect of, you know, just these little moments? Um, and what do you think is the, you know, kind of the impact of including them within these kind of larger, otherwise chaotic narratives? Yeah. Um, and, and it was something that I tried to spend a lot of time on, actually, in the book. Because, the, again, when you sort of look at the difference between the experience and the history, um, what we remember as Americans from that day are the sights of 9-11. We remember watching it on television um, or, or watching it, you know, if you're a New Yorker, watching it unfold, um, 
you know, yourself here. And yet, when you go through these oral histories, what really comes out is the way that 9-11 was a 360 degree sensory experience for everyone who it touched. And so I, I spent a lot of time in the book trying to capture uh, the sound of 9-11, the taste of 9-11, what 9-11 felt like to the touch. Um, you know, when you go, when I got into the oral histories of the volunteer firefighters in Shanksville, um, you know, every single one of them talks about the smell of the crash site when they arrive uh, in the field in Shanksville. Um, you know, obviously the, the first responders and the survivors of the collapse of the towers, um, you know, they talk about what the dust tastes like in your mouth. That, it was like having a wool sock in your mouth, or it was like having a mouthful of bisquick. Um, and, and then, you know, everyone in, uh, in Lower Manhattan that day talks about what the dust was like to walk through. Um, you know, the uh, cottony, marshmallowy, fresh fallen snow of, you know, the six to 12 inches of dust that carpeted the, uh, the city. And then uh, what people remember sort of coast to coast that day, um, probably some of you in, that, in the room, uh, no matter where you were, uh, was the quiet that settles over the country on 9-11, that uh, both in New York City and then across the country, you know, businesses let out, schools let out, the airplanes are grounded. And so, you know, people talk about stepping out into lower Manhattan that after, or stepping out into, Manhattan that afternoon, and just realizing how silent the city of New York was for sort of the first and only time in its history. And that that was something that you sort of hear across the country. I quote a guy in Fargo, North Dakota, um, who talks about stepping outside that afternoon and realizing how silent Fargo, North Dakota was. Because once you take away the, the planes, sort of suddenly, you know, this noise that is the backdrop of sort of our daily life that you never think about when it's there, you suddenly notice the absence and the quiet. Um, thinking about the sensory experience um, of 9-11, something, again, as somebody who, who is around these stories very often, um, in addition to the Flight 93 crash site and the first responders and officials that had rushed there, um, another scene that I, I don't think I fully grasped um, just how difficult the circumstances were there was when the military and civilian Pentagon workers were leading the initial rescue efforts at the Pentagon. Um, and in particular, the story of Staff Star Sergeant Christopher Bramman and Sheila De De Denise Moody, who is an accountant, um, struck me because he, um, he is somebody who is going in again and again to try to save people. She's the only person that he manages to save um, who actually ends up living. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that story because the way you frame it, it's you see it, um, you you feel it, you you hear kind of the experience in a way that I don't think I've quite understood before. Yeah. Um, so at, at the Pentagon, everyone who lived was rescued in the first thirty minutes, um, and so there was a uh, you know sort of this incredible makeshift effort to rescue uh, you know, people trapped in the inferno in the Pentagon. And it was uh, largely done by sort of military members uh, who are sort of trying to rescue their coworkers, um, many of whom you know, sort of rush out of the building and then rush back in. Um, and Christopher Bauman, uh, and his story was, is one of the most famous uh, of that um, I think he he ends up going in back into the building I think four times um, brings out four people um, uh, and and Sheila uh, is the only one who lives um, but that uh, she ends up she is so uh, so so part of uh, I'll, I'll back up a step part of what it was so fascinating to me in working in this uh, in this story was 
the way that sort of random luck or fate or chance unfurls through that day, that sort of the way that um, decisions that we make a thousand times a day without any, without thinking anything of at all, end up literally being the difference between life and death on 9-11. Um, uh, in New York, Michael LaMonaco, the chef at Windows on the World, um, would have been normally in his kitchen at 8.30 on Tuesday morning, but that morning of all mornings, he decides to uh, stop and get a new pair of lens, a new pair of glasses at Lens Crafters on the way into work uh, in the shopping concourse underneath the World Trade Center. And so he, uh, 72 of his colleagues died that day, and he didn't because he bought a new pair of glasses. Um, and in uh, um, and at the Pentagon, there are these two women, um, Louise and, and Sheila, um, both of whom it's their first day working at the Pentagon. Um, and they're sort of sitting there, you know, it's 9.37 in the morning when the plane hits, and that they are uh, sitting there filling out their HR firm forms, you know, sort of trying to get oriented in their office. Um, and one of them goes to the fax machine to start faxing in the paperwork, um, and the plane hits at the precise moment she hits the send button on the fax machine, and so all she knows is that she's hit the send button and the building explodes around her. And so she's standing there being like, what did I do to the fax machine? Um, which is not like a totally illogical reaction. Um, it, yeah, <laughs> government IT, I mean, it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not always the, uh, what it's cracked up to be. Um, and uh, she, uh, you know, Louise and Sheila, they end up uh, sort of getting trapped in there. And Christopher Brahman ends up coming in. And uh, the, the smoke is so thick that the only way that they find each other is their clapping. Um, and that they can hear sort of the, the clapping and walk towards the clapping and end up uh, he ends up rescuing her and, and, and pulling her out, um, and, and the other woman gets out um, of, of her own, and they sort of meet back up on the lawn of the Pentagon, um, uh, you know, just within minutes. And, you know, had it been, you know, five minutes longer before Chris Brahman got into that office, um, you know, it's quite possible she wouldn't have made it. A little bit about people who had official roles on 9-11 and so um, in the article that you wrote for Politico we get a sense of uh, President Bush's experience and those who were surrounding him um, one one account though it's brief that struck me was actually within the Pentagon with um, uh, Donald Rumsfeld um, you know he was being he his official role was to lead the nation's response militarily to the attacks and yet he was very clearly conflicted by you know, this innate human desire to just try to help his colleagues. And so his, the people who were around him kept saying, you know, you can't go there, you can't go there, and he just kept wanting to go there. Um, and, and this repeats again and again, you know, uh, whether it's a firefighter or whether it's, um, you know, a principal who um, is supposed to take kids to safety but knows that her sister is trapped in the upper reaches of the North Tower. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of, you know, similar kind of connections, connective tissues that you find as you, as you were putting the book together? Yeah, it, um, I'm glad you asked because uh, this is this to me is one of the most interesting themes of the way that the government responds is that you sort of see all of these people torn between sort of the official response and the human response, and Don Rumsfeld is, is sort of the most clear example of it, which is you know he is the Secretary of Defense, he's the top uh, you know. Pentagon leader, um, the man who is in charge of the nuclear codes after the, the president. And he is uh, under the official protocols, which he knows very well, because remember, he, he has been uh, a White House chief of staff and, and secretary of defense before. Um, he is supposed to be evacuated from the Pentagon within minutes uh, and, and taken to the mountain bunker uh, in Raven Rock uh, in Pennsylvania. 
And instead, he goes down to the crash site and, you know, sort of his whole protective detail is like trailing along behind him as he sort of marches down to the crash site. Um, and they end up, you know, literally carrying stretchers and carrying wounded out of the Pentagon. And it was the exact right thing for him to do as a organizational leader. And, and it really endeared him to the military in a way that, um, you know, very few secretaries of defense have ever sort of had that relationship with the military before. Um, and yet, as a constitutional officer in charge of the nuclear codes, it was precisely the wrong thing for him to do. Um, and Donald Rumsfeld doesn't return to the Pentagon's command center, the National Military Command Center, uh, until about 10.30. And by that point, the attacks are all over. And Donald Rumsfeld has not given a single order uh, during the entire time that the attacks are unfolding um, and was entirely absent from the nation's response. And uh, to the point that actually at the White House, uh, they think that Don Rumsfeld has been killed. Um, that they, you know, from the White House, they know the Pentagon's been hit. No one can find the Secretary of Defense. No one, uh, no one has heard from him. And they assume he's dead or wounded. And, uh, and, and then actually, um, you know, during this whole time is when Dick Cheney in the White House bunker uh, gives the order to shoot down mm -hmm. uh, hijacked airliners. He and uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld finally connect on the phone uh, at about 10.42 that morning. And Cheney says, and again, this is all sort of fog of war, none, sort of people not really understanding what has transpired. Um, Dick Cheney says to Don Rumsfeld, like, we've shot down a couple of airliners. Um, and Don Rumsfeld is like, huh. Um, and, and is just like really taken aback and sort of, you know, but all of this has unfolded while he's out doing uh, the... Um, you know, helping to rescue wounded from the crash. I want to talk a little bit about that moment, the kind of the military response that didn't happen, and yet you include it in the book. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about kind of what unfolds and the significance of it? Yeah, um, and this is, so uh, Dick Cheney is at the White House. Uh, he's whisked from the uh, his office at the White House into the bunker under the North Lawn uh, in the minutes after the second attack when they think that the, there are still hijacked airplanes on their way towards Washington, United 93, uh, potentially others. And, uh, and, and it's this incredibly you know, dramatic and fateful moment at the White House. You have the Secret Service yelling at staff, you know, take off your shoes and run. Um, and the Secret Service stays. And one of the Secret Service agents in, in the book, um, you know, yells in the command center, uh, after impact, anyone who survives, go to the alternate command center and we'll continue working from there. Um, you know, most of the Secret Service agents that morning sort of expect that they are going to die standing post as uh, the next plane hits. Um, Cheney under the North Lawn in this Cold War bunker. Um, you know, this bunker runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and has since Harry Truman's time and has never been used for its intended purpose before or since, except for the morning of 9 11. And Cheney ends up in this bunker with this uh, Navy commander named Anthony Barnes, who is. Uh, the director of the White House bunker, effectively, that day. And um, Commander Barnes ends up being the one who goes to Cheney and says, you know, sir, we need uh, permission to shoot down hijacked airliners that are inbound to Washington. And Cheney says yes. And Commander Barnes had never spoken uh, publicly before um, talking to me for the book. And he's, he told me about how he went back to Cheney repeatedly to sort of repeat the question and repeat the answer. 
um, because he knew what a momentous moment this was. And he ends up uh, sort of angering Cheney, who's basically like, yeah, I've already told you, shoot down the hijacked airliners. We don't have more time to talk about this. That order um, ends up getting translated out to the fighter pilots, um, and notably sort of two of them who uh, we follow in the book, uh, Heather Penny and Mark Sasseville, uh, who are uh, at the DC Air National Guard at Andrews Air Force Base, and are scrambled into the air uh, with no weapons. And uh, you know, this we were totally unprepared for this attack that day. And so they, we get these two planes into the air um, from Andrews, uh, and they understand that they are being launched on a kamikaze mission, that the only weapon that they are being sent into the sky with is their own fighter jet, and that if they encounter a hijacked airliner, their job is going to be to crash it into the hijacked airliner um, before it reaches whatever its intended target is. And uh, so they are shouting back and forth to each other on the tarmac as they are sort of settling into their planes, uh, you aim for the cockpit, I'll aim for the tail. And sort of trying to talk through like what the procedure is to crash your own plane into a hijacked airliner. Um, and w what is interesting about sort of this whole thing as it unfolds is it's this incredible disconnect that morning between the experience that people are having and the impact that they're having. Um, because this conversation that Dick Cheney has uh, happens at about 10, 12 that morning. That's the best, uh, somewhere between 10, 12 and 10, 18 is the closest time frame that we can come up with, um, that the 9-11 Commission has come up with for when Cheney gives the shoot down order. And Heather Penny and Mark Sassville don't take off until about 10.30 um, from Andrews. And what none of them realize as these conversations are unfolding is, of course, Flight 93 has crashed at 10.03. Um, there are no more hijacked airliners in the sky. And that, um, uh, that you know, they're sort of having these incredible sort of dramatic moments and these sort of weighty conversations without realizing that actually like history is over, like the day is done, and they have no sense that you know there are no hijacked planes left in the sky at that point. Yeah, and I want to point out too that I think something that strikes me particularly in the way that you laid out these oral histories is that you know these are trained pilots who understand what their duties are. Um, Mark, you know, they literally say, I'll ram the cockpit and I would take the tail. Mark Sassville says, I was going into this moral or ethical justification of the needs of the many versus the needs of the few. Um, Lieutenant Heather Lucky Penny, I genuinely believe this was going to be the last time I took off. If we did it right, this would be it. Um, and yet, of course, later they find out um, that the passengers of Flight 93 launched the counter-assault. Um, and she reflects, the real heroes are the passengers on Flight 93 who were willing to sacrifice themselves. And it, it almost kind of creates this, um, you, you throw back to what Mark Sasswell was saying, he was still trying to kind of understand that in his own head. Yeah. You have civilians on a plane who had figured that out and had already carried that out by the time, even before this, this conversation was yeah. happening internally for them, which then goes back to, kind of what you're saying about kind of the heroism and kind of the, the courage that comes through met with an unimaginable circumstance. People have make unthinkable, extraordinary decisions that have a huge ripple effect um, on everything else. Yeah, and, 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 then, and then of course, you know, the plane crashes in Shanksville. And one to me of the most breathtaking quotes in the whole book uh, was uh, the, uh, Denise Miller, who is a police sergeant for the Indian Lake Police Department, which is one of the small communities near Shanksville, and is one of the first police officers uh, to arrive at the crash site. And she talks about how scared she was being at the crash site, because she's arriving, and she knows just four facts. Two planes have hit the World Trade Center, and one plane has hit the Pentagon, and the fourth plane has hit this field right here. And she assumes rightly so, based on the knowledge that she has, the terrorists picked this field for a reason. And she assumes that there's something under this field that the terrorists are trying to blow up, that they know about that she doesn't. 
And again, based on the incredibly limited set of facts that she has, um, you know, she knows two planes hit the World Trade Center. So she's standing there assuming that there's, there are more hijacked airliners coming to crash into this field. And she's sort of standing there in this field, surveying this crash, sort of watching the sky, waiting for the next plane that's going to come and hit this field. Um, you know, because uh, you know, for that day, no one had any idea why this plane had crashed in this one sort of specific place in Shanksville. Um, so I do want to kind of, uh, we're going to take some audience questions so you can start thinking about those. Um, I want to turn to a chapter in the book that's called The 9-11 Generation. Um, so I'm going to give away my age, rare, rare, rare time I will do that, I am 31. Um, but this chapter is interesting because it actually, um, it, it tracks uh, through oral history by age what people reflected on when they were a certain age in the book. So naturally I went to where I was, eighth grade. Um, it didn't really totally you know, kind of reflect my own experience. Um, but then I found this one, which I'm going to read out loud. Um, age 16, 11th grade, this is Talia Hain in New Jersey. Um, September 11th was also picture day in my high school. If you were lucky enough to have a last name like Anderson or Charles, you probably made it through the gymnasium queue before 9 a.m. Your smile looks genuine. If you were a Daniels or an Elton, you probably picked up on the fact that something had happened. Gossip spreads like wildfire in any high school, but hadn't yet gone back to a classroom with a television. If you're a Gore or a Hein, like me, you were screwed. You had to watch the whole terrible thing unfold before your eyes. And then you had to sit to have your picture taken for the yearbook. The command to smile sounded like the worst insult. And this is, for me, it captured something that I think will stand the test of time. Every teenager knows what it's like to have your picture taken at the beginning of the year for the end of the year to be then canonized in a yearbook that everyone will have forever in time. And so um, in thinking about the 9-11 generation and the generations to come, I think in, something that I've been thinking about working in the education department at the 9-11 Museum is what do you think is going to be, what are the stories that we need to co continue to tell? And also what are the hard things that um, what will be hard to communicate about 9-11 that you hope this book will communicate? Yeah. Um, so I, I thought this was w one of the most interesting chapters that, that I worked on because you see, you know, I, I go from babies right through college, sort of every, every person, you know, at, at every age in there. Um, and, and it was sort of so fascinating to see 9-11 refracted through children's experience, through the adults around them. That sort of the, the way that the children, particularly younger, sort of don't realize, you know, they don't know what's going on, but they know that the adults around them are scared and, that, and are sad, and sort of how, how that reaction sort of shaped them. Um, for a number of them, they sort of talk about 9-11 being the first memory that they actually have in the world. Um, and and then of course, as I was saying earlier, you know, we're now in the situation where uh, you, you have a generation that have no memory of 9/11 whatsoever, um, and are increasingly sort of born after. I mean, a, a quarter of the U.S. population uh, now has no memory of 9/11 whatsoever, um, and that, uh, and yet it is a world that. It, you know, our, our politics and our international geopolitics is still the world that 9-11 created. Um, you know, uh, up until, uh, you know, this week, we, or uh, this month, we see, you know, the collapse of the Taliban peace talks, you know, sort of still unfolding and rippling through uh, our country and, and the geopolitics of the world. And as I said earlier, I think what is just so important in that we it is remembering the impact of 9/11 above and beyond the facts of 9/11, because it just uh, when you look at the decisions that we made, and I, you know, most of what I do uh, in sort of my day job is covering national security, and um, you know, I sort of. The, the backdrop of 9-11 is every story that I write about the FBI and counterterrorism, DHS, the rise of uh, you know, government surveillance, um, you know, the border 
Um, you know, this, these are all things that are, were sort of fundamentally changed and altered by 9-11. And that that is uh, something that's really hard to underscore sort of just how much our country changed on 9-11. Um, and, and I try to talk about that in the book during what I see as the, the most interesting moment of 9-11, which is the 17 minutes from the first crash to the second crash, the period from 8.46 in the morning to 9.03, when the country writ large in New York sort of very specifically sees the first crash and shrugs. And sort of everyone sort of has some version of the same reaction of, oh, it's a small plane, uh, it's an aviation accident, the pilot had a heart attack, Air traffic controls having a really bad day, um, it, you know, sort of all of these reactions. I, um, I, I quote um, Brian Gunderson, the uh, director, the uh, uh, the chief of staff to the House Majority Leader that day, Dick Armey, who talks about he sees it on TV as he walks into his morning staff meeting, and says that he sort of thought it was going to be like a school shooting. Um, sort of one of those stories that's like a big deal in national news, but doesn't fundamentally alter anyone's business that day. You know, doesn't fundamentally change anyone's schedule that day. And that that was the experience almost everyone had at that first crash. And um, uh, one of the other sort of breathtaking quotes in uh, that I came across in this was um, Peter Johansson, who's one of the New York Waterway ferry captains, that morning, who talks about witnessing the first crash from his ferry. And they continue on to Wall Street Terminal. They dock. Every single commuter on the boat gets off and walks into Lower Manhattan. And they're literally walking through the papers and envelopes fluttering down from the impact into the North Tower. And yet there wasn't a single person on the boat who said, you know what, this just kind of seems like it might be a weird day. I'm going to go work from home for the rest of the day. Um, sort of everyone sort of sees that crash and is like, no, oh, that's just weird. Like, weird stuff happens in New York all the time. And, and so when we talk about sort of, when we sort of say in passing, like, well, 9-11 changed everything, I, I think it's really easy to forget just how much actually 9-11 changed. And you know, when we talk about what it's done to our country, when we talk about what it's done to our culture, um, uh, you know, sort of what it's done to the world that we're handing off to a new generation, like look at last month when you saw that video of the motorcycle backfiring in Times Square, and everyone runs for their life. Um, and like that's where America is today. And you go back to you know 8:46 Tuesday, September the 11th, and there was sort of room in our lives for weird stuff to happen um, without us being fearful, and that that's just sort of not where our country is anymore. Let's take a few questions from the audience. We have mics that are coming down both aisles. We'll start in the back and work towards the front. Um, back there. So uh, I've I've read a few of your or I've uh, listened to a few of the podcasts that you've appeared on since the book release and um, uh, my 9/11 experience I was in uh, preschool and pre-K mm. and uh, it's one of the early things that I remember um, and I one of the things you sort of just mentioned and and uh, I found interesting in the podcast is the innocence of America that existed pre 9/11 obviously yeah. it's after Columbine um, which had an impact but. You know, one of the reasons I bought this book, other than reading my for, for myself, is passing down to a future generation my children. And, uh, you know, do you think that there's a world where uh, America is ever that innocent again, or do you think we're sort of stuck with where we are now? Uh, I, I don't I don't see sort of how we unwind, uh, you know, sort of where we are right now. Um, and, um, it, you know, it, and 9-11 was a part of this um you know, it, it's not the, uh, it, it's the major hinge in the modern world. I mean, I, I sort of talk about it as, uh, you know, 9-11, I think, is sort of a, as clear a dividing line as we have between the 20th century and the 21st. Um, 
and that in many ways, I think when you look at our modern world, you know, 9-11 is where it started. Wait for the mic first. Just one second. Yeah, um, I have uh, two quick questions. I've always wondered, the passengers who took down United 93, do you think they were trying to stabilize the plane and save their lives or crash it and prevent further terrorist attack? And the other thing is, did that astronaut take photos or video or anything? Um, it, yes. Uh, there. I think you guys have some of the, uh, I, we run one of the photos in the book, um, and I think, and there, there are photos uh, from the International Space Station that day. Um, and uh, it, so, uh, Flight 93, um, uh, so uh, we always shorthand this as the passengers who took back Flight 93. Um, it's the passengers and the crew, and, and I, I sort of draw that distinction um, because uh, when you sort of talk to family members of the crew, they sort of feel like they have been written out of the history that we tell of Flight 93. Um, and, and so I sort of always try to draw the distinction, and, and, I, and I hope I've said it correctly every time in the book to try to draw the distinction that it, it was a joint effort by the passengers and the crew. Um, on, on Flight 93, and and I think um, I don't know that we know what their ultimate intentions were. Um, I don't think there is, uh, and you might sort of have a more precise understanding of this than I do. I don't think we have any reason to believe that they thought that they had a capability to take back the plane and land it safely. Um, uh, because I don't, I don't think that we have a reason to believe that there was any capability among the passengers and the crew left to pilot and land the plane um, because the pilots had been killed. Um, and uh, oh. the the cockpit voice recorder that we have makes it seem like it was ultimately the, the hijackers who crashed the plane, um, uh, but that they sort of only did so basically when they realized that they were about to lose control of the plane and be overpowered by the passengers and the crew, um, and that they, talk a, the, the, they talk in the cockpit voice recorder um, uh, about, you know, don't crash the plane yet, wait until they get into the cockpit, and then put it down. And then as the passengers and the crew get into the cockpit, um, they put the plane down. I, I believe there was, but I think, you know, going, uh, yeah. yeah, but going off of the recordings, um, and, and it's covered well in the book, I think you, you have the recordings that say that they were trying to take back the plane, um, but also, but there was no kind of explicit suggestion that they were taking back the plane to land it or to gain control of it, but they knew that they wanted to take it back. Yeah. All right. Maybe we have time for one more question. Uh, right there. I'm curious, how did this project change your perspective on the day and the country writ large? Mm. Um, so I, uh, in a couple of different ways, um, and I've covered some of it tonight. I think for me, part of it was just the realization of how much unfolded over the course of that day um, that was really improvised. Um, you know, sort of just these incredible stories of the way that Americans, you know, individually, organizationally, institutionally, officially um, responded to a day of absolutely sort of unprecedented challenges. Um, and, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, Ben Sliney or... Um, uh, 
or, or, or Michael Day or Vice President Cheney or, or President Bush. Um, uh, I, I think America was uh, uh, America was lucky to have the people in the positions that it had them in on 9-11. Um, and that I think we are lucky that we had the leadership that we had on 9-11. Um, uh, and, and I say that without wanting to get into sort of any sort of discussion of anything that happened thereafter. But on, uh, on 9-11, I actually think our government responded very well. Um, and uh, and then I think to me the the second thing was uh, that that really did sort of change my perspective on the day was realizing realizing just how much it has changed our country in ways that we sort of don't even trace back to nine eleven anymore. Um, you know that you know so much of the stuff that I write about um, in sort of my day-to-day -day national security reporting, um, we don't even think about that being part of you know the world that it was changed after 9/11. Um, and 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 I think that that again sort of coming back to. Uh, Thinking about you know what's the memory that we hand off to a next generation of this event is really trying to figure out like how you capture and explain how different the United States was before 9/11 and sort of how much of our modern world was created because of 9/11 or in reaction to 9/11. Because you know we have a quarter of the country now who uh, literally doesn't remember 9/11 at all, um, and a much larger percentage of the country um, that has never known you know any adult life that wasn't post 9/11 America. Um, you know, and and you see that in like lots of different ways, right? Like you, like you go back to uh, you know the way that 9/11 starts, and you're like, okay. Uh, on Tuesday, September the 11th, you were allowed to bring knives on a plane. And like you try to sort of say that to people now, and they're like, well, like, that's dumb. Like, like who, who hadn't thought of that before? But like, um, and you know, there's sort of all of these little things. I mean, you could carry liquids on a plane on 9-11. I mean, sort of all of these things that, you know, we, we can barely remember these things uh, taking place uh, you know, before. So on that note, um, I'm going to welcome everyone to pick up a copy of Garrett's book, The Only Plane in the Sky. It's being sold uh, just outside the auditorium. Um, if you sign up for a museum membership at the table just across from the book sale, you'll receive 20% off your book tonight. Um, also, if you sign up as a benefactor level or above, you'll receive the book for free. Um, next Thursday, September 26th, we have partnered with the Central Intelligence Agency to bring you three key perspectives on 9-11, one of whom um, is uh, profiled in Gar Garrett's book or included in Garrett's book, former acting CIA, CIA directors John McLaughlin and Michael Morell and former CIA senior paramilitary officer Phil Riley will discuss how the agency was uniquely positioned to support policymakers and military operations in the crucial 15 days <coughs> immediately following the attacks, as well as how 9-11 ushered in a new era of intelligence work. If you haven't booked tickets for that, you may do so at 911memorial.org slash programs. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope you come back for more programs. Thank you, Derek.